just a, a little bit uh, about me. Like I said, I like to have conversations. I also like to tell jokes. Uh, I also have already had a little bit of a conversation this morning with somebody about seeds. I, I enjoy growing. I enjoy seeing things get planted in my garden. I enjoy tending them. I enjoy seeing the greenery grow. I enjoy the flowering. I enjoy the fruiting process. But the sweetest part of all of that work is, well, what do you think the sweetest part is? Thank you, Miss Janie. That's right. The sweetest part of gardening, of growing anything, is the harvest. And why is that? Why do we enjoy the harvest so much? Because we worked so hard. Because we worked hard for it. Fruits of our labor. That's it, right? The fruits of our labor. Well, I just want to remind you guys this morning that you all, you all, I'm from the south a little bit, so I'm throwing some you alls every once in a while, that you all, and all of you, are the fruit of Christ's labor. You sit here as the harvest of the master gardener. Right? Yeah. We talked about planting seeds a little bit. I was speaking with my new friend Jennifer over here. Right? We're talking about gardening and what, uh, what varieties we like to grow. When we all like to grow varieties of plants that will bear fruit. And Jesus is the master gardener is the same way. He likes to put and pour his time into things that will bear fruit. He actually tells us a lot throughout the gospel. He speaks about, I am the vine and you are the branches, right? But he also talks about how those vine, or those branches that don't bear fruit, they'll be removed. Now, are there things in your life that you're dealing with that aren't bearing good fruit right now? I think that we all struggle sometimes where we may have a seed that's been planted in our lives that we didn't put it there, right? And the Holy Spirit didn't put it there. But we talk, uh, we, we, we always are hearing about things um, bearing fruit in our lives, right? I was, uh, on the way here this morning, I was driving down, there was a billboard, and it was uh, one of those billboards where they're trying to put, a, put out a, a positive message. You know, you've seen those ones like, you know, it's, it's like on Saturday morning cartoons with the star, the more you know, right? Everybody remembers those, come on, Saturday morning cartoons, right? Yes. You know, well, okay, you're a little young. I apologize that they ruined Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> for the new generation. But it, back in the 80s and 90s, right, at the end of every cartoon, they'd have like a little, you know, two-second message about it. And you know, the little, right, about how to be a better friend and a better neighbor. And then when the star would come across the screen, the more you know, right? Well, this is one of those. But, and it's not, it doesn't have the same power because it's not moving. But it was um, characters from a movie, and they were climbing up a chasm. Strange, right? And, and all it said is, your words have power. Okay? I didn't understand why the image had anything to do with your words having power, but you know what? I like the message. Because your words do have power. The words that we speak in our lives, they're seeds, and sometimes the ones that we tend are the ones that are going to grow. Right? Um, it's very easy to focus on the bad or focus on the good, but when we invest in something, we get a return. There's always that return. So this morning we're going to invest a little bit in tending the understanding of what the supremacy of Christ is in our lives. We are all uh, dealing with so many things. There's so many things in this world to distract us. Um, so what we're going to talk about is what it means to fix our eyes on Christ. Right? All right, so who brought their Bible with them this morning? All right, there's no condemnation if you didn't. I'm going to read everything. All right, so I forgot I forgot my own passcode into my iPad. All right. All right, so I, I you know, some people, they look at me when I'm sharing out uh, of, of digital. I, I really like digital media. Um, because there is the ability to read through multiple translations at once. All right. Now, I will be reading this morning primarily out of the New King James Version, not because I think that it's supreme in its understanding, but because it's, it's easy to understand. Okay? There is uh, truth and wisdom in a multitude of witnesses, and um, I like to dive into many different translations to get a better understanding sometimes of, of what was being said. But I also have my Look Smart Bible today. That was, okay. 
<laughs> this is my Look Smart Bible. Who else has a Look Smart Bible with either Greek or Hebrew in it? All right, thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one that has a Look Smart Bible. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't whip this out to look smart. Although sometimes people just think, oh, you're just trying to look smart, right? Look learned. But that's not it at all. The reason why I like to read out of a direct translation from the original text is sometimes it gives us a little better insight. Because Greek is one of those languages, which is, just in case you don't know, the New Testament is written in Greek. Greek is one of those languages that it has so many possible meanings for different words, right? Let's look at the word at English, okay? If I say, yo, that's my dog, all right? That's some, some street lingo. I could be speaking about that's my dog, right? Or Alex, that's my dog, right? <laughs> He's my friend, right? Or, oh, such a dog, right? It could be a bad thing, right? Uh, I also work with, uh, for a Japanese company, and there's uh, certain words in Japanese that, depending upon the context, uh, there's a word that could either mean pig or father. Now, I know that sounds pretty good for some of us. We're like, yeah, that's appropriate. <laughs> However, we're not going to speak that word today. Right? We're going we're to talk about context a little bit. Uh, and when we look at context, it kind of brings some new light from other perspectives. But we're going to have two texts that we're going to be reading out of this morning. The first is going to be in John chapter 16. So go ahead and, and head there real quick. And if you have a, a paper Bible where you can put bookmarks or something like that, the next one we're going to be reading out is going to be in Colossians chapter 1. Now, as I said, this morning we're going to be having a discussion about the supremacy of Christ. When you go to Taco Bell and you order a soft taco, what do you get? A soft taco. But what's on it? Come on, what's on a soft taco at Taco Bell? Cheese, meat, and cheese. Oh, easy now. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no, nope. meat, cheese, and lettuce. Meat and cheese and lettuce, and that is it. That is it. It is the basic. It is the base, and it is the one that you feed your kids because it has the least amount of complaining ingredients, right? Unless you have a child like mine that picks out the lettuce. All right, but when you step it up and you're willing to pay that extra forty-nine cents. And you order a soft taco supreme. Yeah. <laughs> what comes on that? Tomatoes and sour cream. Tomatoes and sour cream. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody likes her tomatoes and sour cream. She's a little too excited. She's like, Woo! Tomatoes and sour cream. Right? Ten years. <laughs> I know, right? But does it make your mouth water just thinking about it? All right. So, so many people will talk about Jesus. And to him, he's just meat, lettuce, and cheese. Right? How many of your friends do you speak with? And when you say Jesus, they kind of look, yeah, he's just meat, lettuce, and cheese. Come on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? You say Jesus and people almost get offended. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You say Jesus and they're thinking, hmm. It's like you just handed them a regular old taco with meat, <laughs> lettuce, and cheese. But this morning, we're going to talk about how to put that little bit of sour cream and that tomato on there to make it just a little more desirable. If you give people the choice, usually between a soft taco and a soft taco supreme, what are they going to choose? They got the extra 49 cents. They're going to get that top soft taco supreme, right? All right, if you don't like tacos, I apologize. All right, let's talk hamburgers, all right? You get a cheeseburger. What's it got on it, right? Meat, cheese, maybe ketchup. No, you're going too far sometimes. It depends upon where you go, all right? All right. Oh, well, okay, Mickey D's, all right. But if you get a deluxe or a supreme, what's it? It's got the lettuce and the tomato and the mayo, and you can ask for the secret sauce, right? An Angus burger. <laughs> Hope nobody's hungry this morning. All right. I like to eat, all right? Um, but when we talk about Jesus, we're going to talk about a little bit about how he becomes supreme, right? How he becomes that little bit extra. That little bit more than just ho-hum, ho-drum, everyday life. And that's what we are here for this morning, is to get that little bit extra. To get above and beyond the ho-hum, ho-drum, everyday life. Amen. Right? We're here for that this morning. How many of you get tired of everyday life? Yes. I get so tired of everyday life. 
But when I've got a little bit of sour cream and onion and tomato in my life, things are just a little bit better, right? I enjoy getting up in the morning. I enjoy speaking with people about those things that I love, like gardening, <laughs> right? I love gardening. All right. Um, so we're going to start in, in John. Uh, and we're going to talk about what it means for Christ to be supreme in your life. All right, now, like I said, this is going to be a conversation. I'm not going to be the one reading all of this. So I want to, um, is, is there anybody who's willing to help me read through a little bit of this? Sure. Well, Linda, I know you will. <laughs> I know Linda will. Yes, Come on now. Who's got a voice and wants to be heard? Who's, who's willing to stand up and proclaim a little bit this morning about the life that you've been given? Right? All right, so we're going to be in John chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 25. And this is a conversation that Jesus was having with his disciples. Let's set the stage here a little bit. Okay, this is just a few days before Passover. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, and he's speaking with them about the future and things that are to come. How many of us like to know what's going to happen tomorrow? Sure. Right? That would be nice to know, right? Well, Jesus had this amazing perspective on everything that he got into. Amazing perspective, right? He, he talks many times about, I don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. But yet this is one time where he begins to address the future. Why do you think it was important for Jesus to begin addressing the future? Because change was coming. Change was coming in his life. Change was coming in the lives of his disciples. And it was time for him to begin preparing them for that which was to come. All right. So we're going to start with verse 25. Um, let's see. Linda, why don't you read 25 through 27, please? These things I have spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh that I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall shew you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I shall, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. Mm. All right, so... He says, I'm not going to talk to you in allegories anymore. How did Jesus like to teach a lot throughout the New Testament, throughout the, the Gospels? How did he teach? Parables. Parables. What's a parable? What is a parable? It's a story, right? It's a story. Because he knew that sometimes we have a hard time as humans grasping subjects. And we need things broken down on a level that we can understand it, right? And so a lot of times he spoke in parables and allegories and in stories so that he could make what his truths were, those truths that he wanted to share so he could make them relatable for us. Right? So many times he talked about moms and children. So many times he talked about you know, like the rich man and the poor man because this was all things that people dealt with on a regular basis. right? How many of you look at people who you know, have big homes and have fancy cars and they're like, oh, that person's rich. right? I don't know how many people you... you are relatable. I have a mom. Can you relate with somebody speak, telling a story about a mom? Sure. Right? Right? This is all relatable things. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, but wait. <laughs> From now on, there's going to be a time where I'm not going to be speaking in allegories anymore. There's going to be a time when things will be revealed plainly to you directly from the Father. There will be a time that you're going to pray in my name, and I don't have to sit there and be that intercession, be that, that interceder for you. I don't have to be that go-between anymore. We have to remember that when Jesus was saying these words, they were still under the law. Right? The Spirit came and went as it pleased. The Spirit did not come and stay and we have a, a strange thing that happened before. Jesus had sent his disciples out, go and do these things in my name, right? He had sent people out to, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, right? To, to speak a, a gospel of deliverance and repentance. But now he's saying, now you're just going to
going to do these things in my name, and I don't have to be the, that mediator in between. Why do you think that there's no longer a need for him to speak in allegories because things are going to be made plain, and there's no longer a need for him to be that intercessor, that go-between? Why, why is that? That's correct. Just as we proclaimed in that confession earlier. Because we are now temples of the Holy Spirit. We are a place where he dwells. And who is the Holy Spirit? And who is God? And who is Jesus? All right. All right. So you see where we're going here, right? So there's, there's no longer a need for these allegories and these stories because now truth will be revealed to you directly. All right? And then now he says... You won't have to, you're just going to have to pray in my name. I might be that conduit, but I'm not the one who has to sit and do that, that, that act of intercession. Why? What was Jesus' final act of intercession for us? Come on now. What? Don't mumble it, say it! The cross! Right? That's right, it is finished. That is broken. The, the need to have a go-between is gone, because... Now, that curtain was torn. The things that separated God from humanity were removed for all time. Yes. So there was no longer the need for him to be that go-between because he performed that final act of intercession for us. I know, you're like, where's this going, Jeremy? We're, go we're getting there. <laughs> Don't worry. All right. And it says that uh, he would sanctify himself for them and that we will all be sanctified in the truth. Right? It is that truth of Christ that sets us free. Right? The truth of Christ, it's, it's that revelation that we receive through the Holy Spirit that gives us that ability to commune with the Most High God. Yeah. All right, now, verse... Oh, I went too far there. There we go. Uh, verse 28, right? So we end with, we have, you have believed that I have come out from God. All right, so verse 28. Brian, I think you raised your hand. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to finish out this section. So go ahead and read all the way down through 33 for me. Okay. I came forth from the Father, mm -mm. and I come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speaketh thou plainly, and speaketh no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee? By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you know, excuse me, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Okay, so uh, in 28, Jesus says, I've come forth from the Father. When something has come forth out of something, what does it usually mean? All right, so we have cellular division. How many of you go back to high school science and you understand the concept of cellular division? Everybody understand the concept of cellular division? No? Oh, <laughs> Alex. When a cell divides, okay, this is, this is a point of multiplication, right? When it divides, first it starts, come on you homeschool moms, first it starts with a bud, right? And it's a, it's a small ball that starts to form on the side of that cell. And then all of the components within that cell divide, and they become whole again. So the division, whole, and then all of those parts separate off, and now you have two cells that are exactly the same, share the same basic DNA, share everything that's necessary to sustain life within those two cells. Christ came out of the Father. That doesn't mean that he was, you know, he was created by God, but he shares the same DNA, the same structure, the same desires, the same love for you that 
the father had. So much so that he was willing to send his only son, right? To die for us. Now, <laughs> he says he's going to leave the world again and go back to the father. That sounds a little disturbing for these poor gentlemen who have spent three years of their life following this man around, learning from him, being taught, trying to understand the parables. There were so many times the disciples were confused. Right? Yes. I mean, how many times do you read through Scripture? And the disciples pondered. These are the guys who walked hand in hand, side by side, hip to hip with the Son of God. And they still were, what is going on here? Right? All right. So now, he's, the, disciples, um, <laughs> the disciples look and say, see, now you're not speaking in Proverbs or parables. You know, something began to click. And they began to understand. Their eyes began to be opened a little bit more about the understanding. And you're not using a figure of speech, or you're not talking in a story. We understand what you're saying. But did they really? Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. But then, then they kind of throw this in. Now, we are sure that you know all things. Right? We're sure that you know all things. And have no need that anyone should question. By this, we believe that you came from God. This was a statement. They made. By this, we believe that you came from God, because Jesus knows all things, right? He had complete and utter understanding of the cosmos, but yet, you know, like the genie, right? Come on, the genie in Aladdin, right? Yeah. Great big power, you be in space, right? <laughs> this, is, this is what happened now, that Jesus is not a genie, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to mix magic and, and God, uh, but it's just a, a, a representation of, of what happened when Christ came to earth, right? Now, and then Jesus answered, oh, so, so, all right, so sometimes when I, when I share out of scripture, um, Jesus comes off a little snarky sometimes. Let's be honest, right? Sometimes he kind of says things, and you're like, and you know, this is, this is um, translated here in, in verse 31. Do you believe now? Oh, so now you believe? You know, after three years and, you know, just a few days before I'm about to get cursed, now you believe? Right? After everything that you've seen me do, now you believe? But this is something each and every one of us struggles with. We struggle every day. Because, and the amazing thing is, is we now have the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus said, everything has now been, we have the ability for everything to be revealed to us. That there is no, uh, the veil is torn. It's gone. There's, there's no mystery about who God is. We have a direct connection to the throne. We are now able to boldly approach the throne of grace. But yet we still struggle with unbelief sometimes. No matter how plain things get. But, Jesus said, but the hour is coming. And then he says, yet, has now come. You will be scattered, each to his own. Now, what's he talking about here? You're going to get scattered, right? Well, what happened when Jesus was arrested in the garden? Did they all stand by his side and say, To death we shall stand with you, my Lord! No. They're like, ah! They ran, right? The last thing they wanted was to get arrested with, uh, you know, with Jesus. Like, you know, and to, most, to the point where some even denied knowing the guy. Uh, that's a crazy one, right? Yeah, we're we're going to we'll explore that one some other time, right? All right. And he says, you're going to get scattered. You're going to leave me alone. You're going to deny me. You're going to walk away. And this is just how it's going to be. But then he says in 33, these things I have spoken to you. Yeah, thanks, Jesus. You've spoken to us, yes. In this world, you will have tribulation. Who's had tribulation this week? Come on now. Yeah. Raise your hand. Otherwise, we're going to pray that lying spirit out of you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I was sharing with Alex a little bit this morning. Talk about tribulation. All right, I am I'm a little OCD when it comes to things. Just a little bit. And I, I, I get concerned about stuff. So we have an old farmhouse. We live in a farmhouse. That we're, it's a 120-year-old farmhouse. We've been working on it, trying to get it, you know, rehabbing and stuff like that. Well, this is the last year. We changed homeowners insurance companies. I love homeowners insurance companies. 
All right. So we, we changed companies and they gave me a list of stuff I had to do. And I went through and I said, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. You know, it's a hundred year old house, forget that. Um, you know, this house has been standing for 120 years without that, we don't need that. But then they had a little line on, you know, peeling paint, please paint your house. And I'm like, okay, well, last year was a rough summer for me. I, I didn't get a chance to paint the house, right? And so I get a notice in the mail last night, I'm sitting down at dinner, worked a long week. I get a note from uh, my insurance company. I thought it was like my renewal paperwork. I'm like, oh, great, they want more money. Well, no, it was even better. You are now no longer going to be covered. We're not renewing your policy because you didn't paint the house. Right? Can I tell you, that was a seed of frustration and doubt. My, my joy was stolen last night. I, I laid in bed until like 2 in the morning. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, it, it, I, and let me tell you. I prayed, I cast out that doubt, I, I was doing all the, I was like, you know, mm, get me behind me, you know, homeowner's insurance company. <laughs> but it continued to fester and grow. This life you will have tribulation. Right? My mom had a magnet on the refrigerator growing up. And it, this is a confusing thing, okay? There was, it was an airplane and it had a statement. It said, you know, God didn't promise, right? Smooth, smooth flight, but a safe landing, right? Didn't promise a smooth flight, but he promised a safe landing. Here was the confusing thing about this magnet, all right? And I kid you not, there was a bird flying the airplane. <laughs> Why does a bird need to be in an Anyway, sorry, uh, rabbit trail, that's a little bunny trail. Why does a bird need to be in an airplane? Anyway, God never promised smooth flight, but he promised a safe landing, right? I never understood that. Then I became an adult, <laughs> got married, had kids, had a job, bought a house. Gosh, there's a lot of turbulence or tribulation in this world, right? Things that, that want to continue to plant seeds in our life. It's things that want to continue to, to choke out the understanding and the passions that we have. Uh, and But it says... Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I have spoken these things that in me you will have peace. Peace. Jesus said in other places, peace not as the world gives. What kind of peace does the world offer? When the world speaks of peace, what are they speaking of? War. A lack of war, war. or an end of a war, right? Mm -hmm. A lack of conflict or the end of conflict. Um, you know, we have a, at the end of every major war, we have these wonderful things that we have peace accords where all these important people come together and they're signing documents that we will not fight anymore. We're going to have peace. How long does that last usually? Come on. Yeah, not long at all, right? Uh, how many of you have more than two children at home? Raise your hand. Okay, even, how many have more than one child at home? <laughs> uh, once your children have kissed and made up, how long does that peace last? <laughs> how long does it last? Five minutes. You are blessed. <laughs> we usually can't get through the apologies without somebody getting hit or an eye poked. Or his toes stepped on, or somebody mumbling under their breath. Will you forgive me? Yes, I forgive you. No, I won't. Right? I mean, <laughs> this is the peace the world gives. Yeah. I'm sorry. Not really. I'm sorry. That I got caught. This is the peace that the world gives. What kind of peace does Christ offer? Everlasting. Everlasting, right? Yeah. Does it mean... We're going to be without trials and tribulations? Yeah, no. no. This is a picture, uh, the picture I always like to think of with this is Jesus walking on the water. He was at peace. He's like, yo, I'm walking on the water. Right? Was, the, was, the, was it like a glassy ocean he was walking on? Was, was it peaceful with no waves and sun was shining and the birds were singing? That's all they draw it. That's, yeah, that's how they draw, right? I mean, you see all these artists' renditions, and you see Jesus walking on water, and you can see his reflection in the water in front of him, and he's like dancing on it. It's like, no, no, no. All right, first of all, <laughs> Scripture tells us that there was a mighty storm. 
The disciples were afraid for their lives. Peace is not an absence of a storm. Peace is what God gives us in the midst of a storm. Yes. And, and when we are focused on the storm, what do we see? The storm. <laughs> right? When we are fearing death, what do we see in everything? Yeah. Death. <laughs> right? But what did Jesus say at the very end of this passage? Fear not because I have overcome. Overcome, overcome just your emotions. Overcome just those bad thoughts that you might have. Overcome those bad seeds that have been planted in your life. Just that? The world. The world. He has overcome the world. And if he has overcome the world, what are, now does that put us? Well, well let's find out. <laughs> right? Let's find out. All right, let's uh, turn to Colossians. I believe actually the scripture tells us that we've become more, more than overcomers. But how do we lay hold of that? How do we grasp on to that rope that's dangling right over us in this pit that we have dug ourselves into? Do we say, oh, I'm just an overcomer? Is that enough? No, there's, there's some steps. There's some understanding that we have to have. We have to, number one, figure out who's that, what's that rope tied to, right? We have to figure out who is in charge here. All right, so Colossians. Colossians was an interesting place, all right? Before the, the, uh, the turn of, of time, before B.C. became A.D., right, Col the, uh, the city of Colossae was a bustling town. It was a port. But then there were other ones that were built, and the importance of this town became less and less uh, within that community. So there wasn't a lot going on for some of these people. And they lived in, in an area where uh, the commerce was based upon shipping, right? Well, this is a, along the, the Sea of Galilee, where, which is attached to the Mediterranean Ocean, which is attached you know, way over into you know, the other oceans. Right? Right? Geography lesson here. Okay. So, we have all of these things that, that were important to the people in Colossae. The, 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 the idea of their value was being diminished as a population. How, have you, how many of you remember, uh, you know, I, I work in the automotive industry, how many of you remember the slowdown back in 20, 2008, 2009, 2010, you know? What, what happened to the Detroit Metro economy because the things that we placed our value in and our identity in began to fail. What happened? Tanked. People Thank you. Yeah, right? I mean, it was, it was a pretty big, it, those are big waves. Right? We, were at the, we were in the bottom of the wave at that point. Because that's where the, the identity of this community is placed. And the same thing happened in Colossae. The identity was as a, as a port town. And that, you know, they were importers and exporters. And as that began to go off into bigger cities like Ephesus, their, 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 their purpose began to diminish. And so when the gospel hit this, this town, this community, the revelation that they were more than their job, and they were more than just a cog in the machine, it caught fire within this, this city, within this town. But anytime there's fire, you have people trying to imitate the fire. And so there were some, some things that were trying to infiltrate into the community here that, uh, that Paul, who had helped to found the, uh, the church in Colossae, he, he began to see some issues arising where people were beginning to put the law back into the gospel. Scripture tells us that Jesus came for freedom. Right? It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. What, what freedom do we have within Christ? What, what are we being freed from with Christ? The law of sin. The law, which is nothing but a, a reflection to show us how bad and unworthy we are to have that direct relationship with Christ. So, 
when the law began to creep back into the gospel that was being taught and back into the community and, and the church in Colossae, there was an issue there. And so Paul wrote this letter in order to help people get realigned back to their purpose and an understanding of who Christ is to them so that they can get rid of this idea of trying to hold to the law and now live within that grace that Christ extends. So, we're going to read starting in verse 9. Who would like to read here? So, this is a, a kind of larger section of scripture, but it's important because I, I want to give a little bit of background. Uh, and so we're going to read starting in verse 9. Uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1. Forgive me. Forgive me. All right. Who would like to read the first, let's see, 9 through, I see you later, sister. All right. Um, we're going to read, you have to read about seven verses, nine through sixteen for us. Okay. All right. Thank you, Yvonne. Paul's prayer for the Colossians. For this cause we also, first the day we heard it. Yvonne, we're going to start in verse nine. I am. Yeah. Just read the title. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, did not cease to pray for you, and to desire ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord, unto him unto him plead all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, mm. giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us met to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness mm. and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and unvisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him. Mm. So this is a, an affirmation from Paul about the changes that these people should have experienced after accepting Christ. So he starts off and he says, these are the things that you should have, right? That you will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. Some people treat the will of God as if it's, uh, if it's, as if it's you know, some golden ticket. they, they got to search for it. But we have an understanding here that there is a will for you that can be made plain and be made known. You know, we, we, we struggle through life. Oh God, if it's your will, if it's your will, if it's your will. Well, his will is, is pretty well outlined right here. Right? This is his will for you. That you will have wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you will walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing. Worthy in a way that we be pleasing to him. Bearing fruit, because of the good seeds that have been planted, right? And growing in the full knowledge of God. That's his will for you this morning. This isn't a, a, a pie-in-the-sky idea. And if, if there's things that are in your life this morning that are holding you back from experiencing these things, then it's time to realign yourself with His will. And we're going we're gonna to deal with some of that stuff, right? Because sometimes we have things that are, are choking us from seeing and understanding His full will and understanding what it means to walk worthy, yes. right? Yes. So many times, I'm not worthy! I'm not, no, he's called you worthy, yeah. right? So many times we think, I can't do this. He says, no, you will bear good fruit, 
right? We, uh, we have uh, so many people that say, oh, well, if only I knew. You can have godly knowledge. You can have godly wisdom. Amen. This is your inheritance that you have received through Christ. It says that you have been delivered out of the power of darkness and transitioned into the kingdom of light. Transitioned. You were, now you shall be. It was and it will be this. This is what you have received. You have received redemption through His blood and the forgiveness of sins. So many people, they want to say, oh, well, with redemption comes forgiveness of sins. It's, a two, it's, a two, it's, a, it's two things. It's two things. The redemptive power of Christ and the forgiving power of Christ. And sometimes we deny Christ the forgiving power because we're holding on to something. We're holding on to, to a, a root of bitterness. We're holding on to a root of hate. We're holding on to this sickness. This is my identity. We hold on to things because it's something that we can say, this is who I am, right? But so many times Christ says, no, this isn't who you are. This is who you are. This, this, this is who you are. You, you should be walking worthy. You, you are able to walk worthy, right? Yeah. That you are able to have redemption. You are able to have forgiveness of sins. Because Christ is supreme. Yes. Yeah. He was before all things. He was the method by which things were created in this world. He is the way by which things will be brought down. When things had exalted themselves over Christ. He is supreme. Amen. It says all things were created in him. Everything in heaven. All the things on the earth visible and invisible. All of the authority. All of the power. Everything that is in this creation was created through him and for him. For Him. What does it mean that all things were created for Him? We are here to bring glory to Jesus. It is for Him that we have this purpose. He didn't just die for us. He died for Him so that we can be redeemed to Him we were his passion. We were his focus. And verse 17 says, And he is before all things, and all things consist in him. There's that song, the old camp song, In him we move and breathe, right? Have our being, you know? And everybody would dance around, we'd all march in a circle, right? But, and, and, but we, we, we minimize it to meat and cheese and lettuce. But he wants to give us the whole kit and caboodle. He wants to give us the supreme. He wants to give us everything above and beyond what we think we deserve. Because in our own mind, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? Nothing. I don't deserve this. Right? But when Christ hands us something, he says, you're mine. You deserve this. Not because of anything you've done, but because what I have done for you. Right? And it says that he is the head of the body and of the church. The word church comes from the word ecclesia, which means the called out ones. The called out ones. Who was the first of the called out ones? This is a little, little Bible trivia. The first of the called out ones. Come on now. Lazarus. Come forth. He was called out of death. He was called out of darkness. Right now, I know it's the old covenant, yada, yada, yada. But it's the first time where you come out, come forth. And he wasn't, you know, there's other times where he said something to come out. But he was, calling, he was calling death or demons out of something. This time he was calling life out of a place of death. And when you are a member of the church, you are a part of life being called out of death. 
And if the death is still holding on to you, or you're still holding on to the death, it's hard to come out. Yes. Right? Right? It's hard to come out when you're still holding on to something. And this is where he's at. He's standing over that pit that we want to hold on to, or we keep digging even deeper, right? With our words, we're digging that pit deeper. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, this is too much. Oh, I can't struggle. But he's standing over us, and he's dangling a rope. I said, come out! He's calling us out. He's calling us forth. And he was there from the beginning. He was the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn. Because even though Lazarus came out of that grave, he still died again. Even though he came out of that grave, he still died again. But Jesus was the first to come out and to stay out and to not go back. Right? So he's the firstborn of the dead. And he is preeminent. What does preeminent mean? Preeminent. What does it mean? First, first and foremost. First and foremost. Supreme, right? He is Jesus supreme. What are you offering when you walk around in your life? Are you just offering Jesus or are you offering Jesus supreme? All right, well, we're here to prepare you this morning to walk out of this room and to be able to offer Jesus supreme to everyone around you. Not Jesus light, you know. <laughs> forget, forget light drinks. Why would I want something that's light? Why, why would I want to have a Diet Pepsi? Right? Don't give me that. I want them calories. Right? All right. <laughs> Jesus is not... Diet Coke, he's the real Coke, the original, right? He's not, he's not the new Coke, because that stuff was nasty. <laughs> All right, I just aged myself a little bit there. Um, but it says that the fullness, because all the fullness of life was pleased to dwell in him. Are you pleased to dwell in him? Are, are you pleased? Are you really walking around life pleased? Well, if not, then you're not experiencing Jesus supreme. You're still dealing with meat and cheese and lettuce, Jesus. You're dealing with Jesus that you've relegated to a Sunday or a Wednesday, and it's, this is all I'm going to do. This is just as enough. This satisfies me. How many tired of just being satisfied? Right? I don't want to just be satisfied. I want to be filled. Yeah. And that's what he's, wanting, he's willing to do. That's what, that's what Paul is saying here is don't just be satisfied with just a little. You need to be satisfied with the preeminence, the supremacy of Christ. I'm going to skip a little bit here. And I am just going to read. Let me make sure I'm reading in the right spot here. All right. I'm just going to read verse 29. I'm sorry, you know what? I forget. I'm going to read 24 through 29 here. And this is uh, something that becomes difficult for some of us sometimes. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings on your behalf. Rejoice in my trials and my tribulations because I have peace, number one, right? But he's going to be, he says, and I fill up in my flesh the things lacking of the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body. I know that's confusing. But he's saying, I am willing to take on these persecutions that I'm going through because of my love for you, because of my desire to see you get the Jesus Deluxe, the Jesus Supreme, right? And that, um, and this is the attitude that we need to be willing to have when we walk out this door. Right? And when we're talking about trials and tribulations, we're not talking about you know, uh, any, any kinds of, of bondages or roots that we're holding on to. We're talking about a willingness to lay down our own desires and to see Him flow through us in a preeminent way. And it says that He desires, this is verse 27, He desires to make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the nations, which is Christ. As we sit here this morning, as we, as we, we, we began to, to dive in a little deeper, we need to remember that everything that goes on isn't to bring notice and attention to us, but it is to bring glory to Him. We're told that we are His glory. Isn't that an amazing thing? You are his glory. You're not just uh, something that he did because it was his duty. He didn't do things out of, out of duty. He did it out of a desire. A desire to see you elevated. A desire to see you residing within his glory. 
Jesus spoke about how, in, in, in John, how we, we're still kind of seeing things in the dark. We're still kind of needing to have things spoon-fed us. He, he, they were still needing to, to kind of be coddled a little bit at that point because he hadn't died yet. He hadn't been lifted on that tree. He hadn't been brought low so that we could be brought high. And that's my prayer for you this morning, that as you understand the supremacy of Christ in all things, that you will begin to live in a way that honors that supremacy. And sometimes the steps that we need to take is recognizing those things that might be holding on to us a little bit, the roots that might still be, be pulling us down. The seeds that we've tended, that now we need to speak death to them. The things that might so easily beset us. Those little waves and those little winds that might not look so little sometimes. So this morning, as we get through worship, this is an opportunity for you to realign yourself with understanding His supremacy in your life. It is by Him and through Him and for Him that you were created and that you are here this morning. So that you can be that light and that life as we go out into our communities. So that we can help our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers and our relatives begin to see and understand their true value and their true purpose. Yes. So I encourage you this morning, take some time, focus, put your eyes on Him. And understand that it is only through Him and by Him that we're here this morning.